For section P6, we're looking at rational expressions. This is a topic that tends to give students a little more trouble than some. So what we're going to be able to do after we get out of this section, our objectives, be able to specify numbers that must be excluded from the domain of a rational expression. Remember, uh, whenever you have a rational expression, uh, it's a fraction and we know fractions cannot exist when there's a zero in the denominator. So that's going to play a large role in that. We'll be able to simplify and multiply rational expressions and of course divide them. Uh, addition and subtraction usually tend to present more difficulties because it requires getting a common denominator. So we'll be doing that. Uh, and then simplify complex rational expressions. This is really a technique that I see students uh, do wrong a lot. If you have a rational expression, we simplify it by multiplying by the least common denominator of all denominators within the expression. So we'll look at some examples of that. Uh, simplify fractional expressions that occur in calculus because of course that's where we're all headed. Wonderful world of calculus. So you need to be able to simplify expressions that you would see in that class. And towards the end of the homework assignment, you'll see uh, the problems where that comes into play and I make sure to do a lot of them. Uh, and then rationalize numerators. Oftentimes we're so concerned about rationalizing the denominator, sometimes you need to, to rationalize the numerator in the expression to simplify it. Okay, up next, first of all, rational expressions. Rational expression is a quotient of two polynomials. The set of real numbers for which the algebraic expression is defined is called the domain. That's always the domain where it's defined. Uh, because the rational expressions indicate division and division by zero is undefined, you're going to have to exclude any rational expressions domain to be any, or sorry, you're going to have to exclude from the domain any value that makes the denominator zero because then your fraction cannot exist. To give you an example of that, here we have a, you know, pretty standard rational expression, 7x over x squared minus 5x minus 14. Am I ever concerned about the numerator of my rational expression? No. As long as it's a polynomial, I know a polynomial exists everywhere. I could care less about the numerator. What I care about is that denominator, because even though it's also a polynomial, if it's ever equal to zero, that fraction cannot exist because any number divided by zero is undefined. So please, please, please make sure you see I'm completely ignoring the 7x. This is not undefined when it's equal to zero, but I'll concentrate on that denominator and say, well, that denominator would factor to be x minus seven times x plus two. Now, if I set that denominator equal to zero, then I can say, well, then either that, that, that denominator would equal zero if either of those factors were equal to zero. So I can say, I know x plus minus seven is equal to zero when x is seven and x plus two would equal zero when x is negative two. Now those are going to form the restricted values of our uh, rational expression. You'll see I have x cannot equal negative two and x cannot equal seven. As long as those two restrictions are considered, this rational function is fine. Now if I ask you to write the domain, you'd say the domain is all numbers from negative infinity up to negative two union with all numbers between negative two and seven, union with any number between seven and infinity. Now for simplifying rational expressions, uh, we say a rational expression is simplified if its numerator and denominator have no common factors um, other than a negative or positive one, and following procedure can be used to simplify rational expressions. We factor the numerator and denominator, and divide both the numerator and denominator by any common factors. We factor that out. For example here, if I will ask you to simplify x squared minus one over x squared plus two x plus one, well, my numerator is difference of two squares. It's going to factor to be x plus one, x minus one. That denominator, you can see that that's going to uh, be a perfect square trinomial. Both the first and last term are perfect squares. The middle term is twice the square root of the first term times the square root of the last term, since it's 2x. So then I can say, well, that's just going to factor to be x plus 1 quantity squared, which for the case of this problem, I write out as x plus 1 times x plus 1. 
Now I can see that the x plus one is a common factor in the numerator and denominator. I can cancel that out. And then this is just going to give me x minus one over x plus one for my final answer. And so that's what I'm showing here on the next page where I cancel out that x plus one and I get x minus one over x plus one for the final answer. And you would have to keep in mind that x could not equal negative one in this problem because if x were equal to negative one, this original problem wouldn't even exist because it would be dividing by zero. So this is our answer if and only if x does not equal negative one. Now multiplying rational expressions. Uh, we can factor all numerators and denominators of the rational expression just like we did when we simplified. But then after we factor those numerators and denominators, when we cancel out any common terms and stuff like that, we'll multiply the remaining factors in the numerator and denominator throughout the entire problem. If you have multiple numerators, you multiply across all numerators. Same thing in the denominators. To see an example of this, uh, this is asking me to multiply, and I would consider this just a step up from simplify, because we are still simplifying, but once we simplify, we'll then multiply and cancel. So I have the first fraction, x plus three over x squared minus four, times the second fraction, x squared minus x minus six over x squared plus six x plus nine. So in order to simplify this, I need to factor the entire expression, so I'll say, okay, that first fraction, the numerator is already factored, but that denominator is a difference of two squares. I can call it x plus two and x minus two. Now, we're multiplying that by the fraction. Here, I need to find factors of negative six that sum to get to negative one. And I say, well, that's negative three and positive two. That's why I factored it to be x minus three, x plus two. This denominator, as soon as I see the first and last term are perfect squares, I'm thinking, yeah, it's a perfect square trinomial. It's going to be x plus three quantity squared. And I know the plus three would be plus three x plus three x for the total of plus six x in the middle. This is gonna work out gorgeously. Now, uh, what I would do, I'm gonna, uh, cancel out the terms that cancel. But before that, uh, you'll notice I said, uh, check for ex uh, excluded values. So you go through every term in the denominator and say, well, I know this fraction couldn't even exist if x were equal to negative two or two or negative three. All of these values would cause me to have a factor of zero in the denominator and make the problem not exist. Now, once I consider the values where the problem does not exist, I cancel out all the common factors in my numerator and denominator. I have an x plus three that cancels. Uh, this x minus three doesn't have anything that cancels with it. This x plus two cancels with the x plus two in the denominator, which leaves us a final answer of x minus three over x minus two, x plus three. Now, keep in mind here, whenever we go and say that this final answer is x minus three, and it really doesn't matter whether you leave it factored as x minus two, x plus three, or if you multiply it back out and call it x squared plus x minus six in the denominator, I really have no preference between those two answers. But let me talk about a common mistake I, I see students make. They'll try to pull the domain restrictions from their final answer and they'll say, oh, okay, this is the answer and the only restricted values are two and negative three. It's not true. Please notice, yes, two is a restricted value. Yes, uh, negative three is a restricted value, but also negative two is a restricted value. Simply because the term that uh, calls that denominator uh, re uh, restricted value canceled out has nothing to do with the fact that it's still a restricted value. So when I had the restricted value at two, it's because of this uh, factor of, uh, I actually was it two or was it negative two? Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at negative two is the one that canceled out. So it was the factor X plus two. This factor canceled with the factor in the numerator, but please notice that domain restriction holds. So X still cannot equal negative two, no matter what. It's irrelevant if that factor cancels out because you say the factor cannot cancel out if the problem didn't exist in the first place. You're like, well, what do you mean by that? 
if you allowed x to equal negative 2, this denominator would have been 0 in the very beginning of the problem, and you wouldn't have been able to cancel anything out because it would have been undefined. So only uh, uh, do your restricted values before simplifying. Don't cancel out terms and then think you can try to find your restricted values. Restricted values needs to come from the unsimplified form. Now, up next, many of the same ideas apply when we divide rational expressions. The only difference whenever we're dividing rational expressions is that whenever you divide by a rational expression, you're going to multiply by the reciprocal of the second term. So notice I say we find the quotient of two rational expressions by inverting the divisor and multiplying. All that means is to multiply by the reciprocal. It's fancy words. Uh, inverting the divisor, flipping, multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'm giving you the problem here that we're looking at. x squared minus 2x plus 1 divided by x cubed plus x. We're dividing that by the polynomial x squared plus x minus 2 over 3x squared plus 3. All right. So if I'm taking a rational expression and I'm dividing by another rational expression, then I leave the first fraction alone and I multiply by the reciprocal of the second. Now, once I get it set up as a multiplication problem, I'll go ahead and factor everything just like I did in the last problem. In this first one, uh, we're going to have a perfect square trinomial. The first and last term are perfect squares. The middle term is minus two times the square root of the first and the square root of the, the last. So I can say that's just going to be x minus one quantity squared, or I could write out x minus one times x minus one. Again, you could have just said I'm looking for factors of positive one that sum to get to negative two. You say, well, negative one times negative one is one. Minus one minus another one is going to give me the minus two for the x term in there. Now that denominator just factors by greatest common factor. I factor an x out and I'll be left with x squared plus one. Please remember x squared plus one is not further factorable. Uh, for my other term here, again, uh, in the numerator, the three x squared plus three, I can only factor out the greatest common factor of three, leaving me an x squared plus one, which will cancel gorgeously with that denominator. When I'm asked to factor x squared plus x minus 2, you can say, well, I'm looking for factors of negative 2 that sum together to get to a positive 1. So I can say, well, that's going to be x plus 2 and x minus 1. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. 2 plus negative 1 is going to give me the positive 1 there. That's why I factored it to x plus 2, x minus 1. Now, I look at all of the terms in the denominator. So every single denominator, notice I'm looking at x times x squared plus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 1. Every single one of those. Right now I'm not concerned about whether the term cancels out or not. I'm just trying to find the restricted values. Since I have an x in the denominator, I have a restricted value of 0. x cannot equal 0. x squared plus 1 can never equal 0, so don't have to worry about that one. x plus 2 would equal 0 when x is negative 2, so I have a restricted value at negative 2, and x plus 1 would equal 0 when x is 1, uh, so I have a restricted value at x equals 1. Okay, so the only factor that did not contribute to a restricted value is the second one, and that's because it can never equal 0. You can't square a number and add 1 to it in the real number system and get a 0. It's impossible. So the first, third, and fourth lead to these restricted values. Now that I've considered the restricted values, I go in and I simplify my problem. So that x squared plus 1 factor canceled. x cannot cancel. x plus 2, there's no factor of x plus 2 in the numerator. x minus 1, yep, there is a factor of x minus 1 in the numerator. So my fully factored final fantastic form of the answer would be 3 times the group x minus 1. And it doesn't matter the order at which you write that multiplication. My denominator, x times x plus 2. Now, I would actually be happy with that format of the answer. Uh, some teachers would want you to distribute through and call the numerator 3x minus 3 over x squared plus 2x. Uh, those two answers are both 100% correct in my mind. Now, I might have you state the restricted values at the end of the problem, and that's where you just have to go back and make sure you understand. You can't just look at the denominators of the answer. 
you have to go back and look at the denominator of the unsimplified form uh, before you canceled things out. And we're going to have all three of those restricted values, regardless of whether a factor that gives you that restricted value cancels out or not. Uh, now, uh, adding and subtracting rational expressions with the same denominator. Uh, usually students struggle more with, that, with adding and subtracting because we're gonna have to force that common denominator. So whenever we add or subtract uh, numerators, we can only do that if you get that second step where you already have the common denominator or else you have to force it. Uh, and then we can simplify just like we did back whenever we multiplied and divided. And again, we'll also have to check for restricted values. An example with this, if I have x over x plus one minus three x plus two over x plus one, you say, well, this is an easy problem. Well, why is it easy? It's easy because you already have a common denominator. So I can go ahead subtract my numerators, keep it over that common denominator and say, well, I'm just going to have x minus the entire numerator of 3x plus 2 all over my common denominator of x plus 1. Now, when I simplify that, my terms of x will combine to give me negative 2x, and I'm also subtracting this too. Please don't forget to distribute that negative to both terms inside the group that you're subtracting. And you did have to subtract the entirety of the second numerator. So I'm gonna have negative two X minus two all over X plus one. And then you can say, well, in that numerator, I could factor out a negative two and I get negative two, over, negative two times X plus one over X plus one. Now I said, well, hey, the x plus ones cancel. I could see a lot of students just putting this final answer as negative two and thinking they're done with the problem and they wouldn't put any restrictions. What I need you to remember is, yes, this rational expression does equal negative two. However, you still have to put, it's not the same thing as negative two when the case that x is equal to negative one. Because if x is equal to negative one, both of these original rational expressions would be undefined. Negative one divided by zero is completely undefined. And this would also give you negative one divided by zero, undefined. So you'd say, well, okay, in that scenario, uh, yes, this problem does algebraically reduce down to negative two, but you can say your answer is negative two as long as X does not equal negative one, because if X does not equal negative one, this problem cannot exist. Uh, if we're finding the least common denominator, uh, we find uh, in, in order to do that, you're gonna need to have all of your denominators factored. And then you'll list the factors of the first denominator because you already know your least common denominator has to have every single term that each one of your denominators have. So a good starting point is to go ahead and put your first denominator down. It has to have that one at least. And then you're gonna add to that least common denominator any factors in your other terms that you're not are that you aren't already accounting for uh, in your earlier terms. So now, in order to get that least common denominator, or, or in the process of getting that least common denominator, we'll be able to get common denominators throughout our entire fraction, which will then enable us to be able to add it together. Uh, let's go ahead and look at that in practice here. So my example six, I have x over x squared minus 10x plus 25. I'm asking you to subtract from that the x minus four over two x minus 10. So I'd say here, well, all right, this first one is gonna be pretty easily factored because the first and last term are perfect squares. The middle term is minus, so I can say, oh, this is gonna be x minus five times x minus five, and the minus five x minus five x would combine to be the minus 10x in the middle. Now my other one, as soon as I see that this factors as x minus five quantity squared, you can bet your other factor is gonna have an x minus five in it, and it does. It's gonna be if you factor out the greatest common factor of two, you'll get two times x minus five. So when I, the steps of that finding the least common denominator that you saw back on the previous two pages, the very first thing I said is go ahead and write every factor that's in your first uh, denominator. So you'd have written x minus five times x minus five. I need two factors of that. Then you go to your second uh, denominator and say, well, okay, my second denominator is two times x minus five. Do I need to put another x minus five? 
No, I already have it. In fact, I have two of them. But do I have a factor of two accounted for? Nope. Then I have to combine that factor of two in with the other common denominator to get my complete least common denominator. So now when I try to work my problem, I'll say, well, all right, that first fraction, that X over X squared minus 10 X plus 25. Yes, that's X over X minus five times X minus five. In order to get a least common denominator, I would need to multiply that denominator by two. I can only multiply the denominator two by, or by two if I multiply the numerator by two. So in this step, I've multiplied the first fraction by two over two. I would take that second fraction, which is X minus four over two X minus 10 and say, well, that fraction already had the two times X minus five in its denominator. It needed another factor of X minus five in its denominator. So I'm multiplied by the second X minus five in that denominator. You can't do that unless you also multiply by X minus five in the numerator. This is the understood multiplication of one to keep the equality of all of the fractions. Okay, so now I could go back into my problem and say, well, now that we have that least common denominator of two times X minus five times X minus five, all I have to do now is combine my numerators. And my first numerator I showed on the previous page was a two X. So I have two X and now I'm subtracting the entire second numerator, which again, keep in mind, it's not just X minus four, it's gonna be X minus four times X minus five. That's where all of that came from. So I take that combined numerator, now I need to simplify it. I'll have to multiply out the X minus four times X minus five to get X squared minus nine X plus 20 there. And then you can say, okay, once you get that, you're subtracting that second fraction. So you're subtracting everything in this numerator. Uh, you'll get a, negative X squared, and normally I would write that uh, first, like I did right here, uh, the negative X squared, two X minus a negative nine X, what's well, gonna be two X plus nine X for a total of 11 X, and then I'll have minus 20. So I get my numerator of negative X squared plus 11 X minus 20 over that least common denominator of two times X minus five times X minus five, and then you might try factoring this, but it's not going to factor. You would say, I need to find factors of positive 20 because the first times the last, the A times C is positive 20. Factors of positive 20 that sum to get to 11 doesn't happen. You could say, well, two and 10 are 12, uh, four and five or nine, it's not going to work. So the numerator is prime. Thus, this would be the final answer of this problem. And you could say the way we would write that final answer, uh, since that numerator is prime and there's no further simplification, yes, this is your answer, but then you would have to remember this answer only exists if X does not equal five, because if X does not equal five, you're dividing by zero in the very first step and that would make these, this problem not defined. Now, complex rational expressions. Complex rational expressions is when we have a fraction inside of a fraction, also called complex fractions. Uh, they have numerators and denominators containing one or more rational expressions within them. A complex fraction must be simplified so that neither the numerator uh, nor the denominator contains any rational expressions. So your goal, anytime you have fractions inside of a fraction, is to get rid of the fractions inside the fractions. And the way that you'll always do that is to multiply by the least common denominator of any denominators throughout the entire rational expression. So if I give you something that looks like this, one over X plus seven minus one over X all over seven. If I ask some students, hey, what's the first step uh, to do in this? They'd say, ooh, you can get a common denominator in your numerator and combine those terms. But horrible idea, horrible idea. What's the birth, best first method to do in this problem? It's to get rid of any fractions inside of a fraction. You must multiply by the least common denominator of all denominators throughout this problem. You say, well, my only denominators in this problem uh, are the X plus seven and the X. 
So if I multiply both the numerator and denominator by x and x plus 7, it's going to make this problem so much easier to work with. That's what I do. So anytime you have a complex fraction, fractions inside of a fraction, you get rid of any fraction in the fraction by multiplying by the least common denominator. In this case, x and x plus 7. Now, keep in mind what's going to happen here, that x and x plus 7, it's going to distribute to every term in this expression. So I'm just rewriting it here. This is equal to this. I'm multiplying by an understood one. Now, when I distribute this term into the first, uh, and I'm showing it out right here, x times x plus 7 times 1 over x plus 7, I get this. And then I distribute this to the second term, I'll get the x times x plus 7 times 1 over x, and I'm still subtracting it. In the denominator, I just have 7 times x times x plus 7. Now, normally, if I were just working this problem out on my own, I would never show this step. It's an unnecessary step to show. But now, why might you want to show it? Well, you might want to, to see how the cancellation occurs. This x plus 7 in the denominator cancels with this x plus 7 in our least common denominator that we're multiplying by. But that's going to leave me the first term as 1x. I see where that comes from. Myself, I would go directly from here to here. I'd just say when I distribute through, the x plus 7s are going to cancel, and I'll have 1 times x per x. Now, I bring down the minus sign. When I multiply this by this, the x's are going to cancel, and I'll have minus the group x plus 7, which is precisely what I have down here. Here, you can look at it a little bit more easily and say this x and this x will cancel. You're going to have minus the group x plus 7. You do need to remember to keep that as a group x plus 7 because we're subtracting the entire group. A lot of students have a bad habit of they'll have exactly that numerator but not a parenthesis around the last two terms and they'll end up with a positive 7 for the numerator which is horrible. That entire group x plus 7 has to be subtracted out. So now Whenever you do that, you can see, well, yes, the x's do cancel in the numerator. I'll be left with a negative 7 remaining after that. And now when I put that over my least common denominator, a term that I had in my overall denominator, I can say, well, it has a factor of 7. That 7 can eliminate with a 7 in the, in the numerator, and I'll have negative 1 over x times x plus 7. Uh, this answer is absolutely fine. If you chose to distribute the x through that and call it x squared plus 7x, that's also fine. But now, keep in mind, you also have to think about your restricted values. And that goes back to the very beginning of the problem. And nothing really canceled out in this one. So you can see your restricted value from the answer. You say, well, x could not equal 0, x could not equal negative 7. Uh, if you went back earlier in the problem, said, was there ever any other factor in any, in any denominator throughout the entire problem? And no. Uh, the only other denominator was a 7, and clearly that's not going to equal 0. Uh, now, fractional expressions in calculus. Uh, fractional expressions contains radicals that occur frequently in calculus, or containing radicals frequently occur in calculus. These expressions can often be simplified using the procedure for simplifying complex rational expressions. Here's what I mean. So let me go back to this problem just a second. Keep in mind, what did I do? I had fractions inside the fractions. How did I simplify them? I multiplied by the least common denominator. I, I want to do the same thing here. So if I'm asking you how to simplify this expression right here, you say, well, what's, what's the problem with this expression? Uh, and I can say, well, it has a fraction in the second term in the numerator. I don't want that. Any time you have fractions inside of a fraction, you will get rid of those fractions inside the fraction. So I can say, okay, how do I get rid of that 1 over x in the numerator or 1 over the root of x in the numerator? I'm going to need to multiply the numerator by the root of x. But I'll also have to multiply the denominator by the root of x because I cannot change the value of the expression. So here's my expression, and I'll say, well, that's equal to the problem times the root of x over the root of x. Now, this root of x distributes to both terms in the numerator, and I'll get the root of x times the root of x plus 1 over the root of x 
times the root of x. In my denominator, I just have x on the root of x. Now, when I simplify this first term, any square root times itself is just the term on the inside. So I get x, square root of x times square root of x is x. I can see that the square root multiplication does precisely what I wanted because my goal was to get rid of that fraction one over the root of x, it's gone. Now that term is just a plus one. My denominator, uh, I just wanted to combine it to one term of x. So I just said, well, the root of x is the same thing as x to the one half power. So I'm gonna have x to the first times x to the one half. That's x to the two over two times x to the one over two. Whenever you multiply like bases, you add exponents. Two over two plus one over two gave me x to the three over two power. Uh, my numerator didn't need any simplifying. It was just x plus one after I distributed the root of x. And this would be a nice final answer here. Now, the only thing that you would need to concern yourself with, and, and in fact, I, you wouldn't have to do this step right here, you could have left it x plus one over x root of x. That, that, that would have been fine, particularly since the original problem had roots in it. Uh, but now going back just one minute, one thing I forgot here, uh, yes, this is the final answer, but what's the restricted value? Sometimes you won't be asked for a restricted value, but in this one you should. Uh, you should say, well, all right, the fact that x is in the denominator means x cannot equal zero. Uh, and the fact that x is inside of a square root would mean that x couldn't equal any negative number and it can't be zero. So your domain for this problem, you, you, you would just list the domain since there's infinitely many restricted values, but the domain of this problem would be parentheses zero to infinity because x could not be zero since it's in the denominator, but it could be any positive value. So you just say, x is equal to parentheses, zero to infinity, parentheses. Uh, now, rationalizing the numerator. So if we have a square root expression uh, that's part of a binomial, we know that we can rationalize it by multiplying by the conjugate. Up to this point, you've probably only ever rationalized denominators. If you're explicitly asked to rationalize a numerator, though, it shouldn't be any uh, trouble, such as in this problem. If I ask you to rationalize the numerator where I give you the root of x plus three minus the root of x over three, then you say, well, okay, how do I rationalize an expression with two square roots? Every single time you multiply by those exact same two roots with the opposite sign in between the, comp or the, the, the root conjugate, not the complex conjugate, that's for imaginary numbers later, which is gorgeous. Uh, but for in this case, it's the root conjugate. So I can say, well, the conjugate of that root expression is going to be the root of x plus 3 plus the root of x. Now, again, it's an expression. You can't just multiply by a value that's not equal to 1. So I have to multiply by that term in both the numerator and the denominator. Now, when I multiply by the conjugate and the numerator, remember, the nice thing about that is it only ever is the first term squared minus the last term squared. The middle terms always cancel. That's the whole point of multiplying by the conjugate. When I square the first term, any square root squared, it's just what's inside. Same thing for that last term, it's just gonna give me an x, but I do need to remember it's a minus x. The square root of x squared is x, but I'm still subtracting it. So I'll have x plus three minus x in the numerator, the x's cancel, I'm just gonna have a factor of three in the numerator. Now notice that factor of three that you're gonna have left in the numerator can cancel with the factor of three that was previously multiplying this group, the square root of x plus three plus x. Now it would have been a bad idea to distribute that through this group because then you might have lost the uh, fact that, hey, that three is gonna cancel with a factor in the numerator. And it does. So now I can say my fully factored final form of the answer is going to be one over. And then since this three canceled, I don't even need this parentheses on this group. And I can just say it's the root of x plus three plus x. That'd be my final nice answer there. Okay, that does it for this section over uh, rational expressions. Please do try the homework on this section. Uh, make sure you compare uh, any problems you're trying to the problems that I've worked out in the homework assignment. Uh, I had fun doing this section and I hope you will too. 
Uh, but please let me know if you have any questions. I'm always here to help you out.